Welcome to Adventures in Grace. This is Jim Hockaday. Well, it's almost Christmas, and uh, Merry Christmas to all of you. We trust you have a wonderful holiday season, that you enjoy the times of the season, all the beautiful music that's being played, and that you take time to acknowledge and remember that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, and thank the Lord that uh, he sent Jesus as a baby in that small town of Bethlehem, 2,000 years ago. Thank the Lord he's coming back as a king today. And so we just let all of you know from our hearts to yours, thank you for being a part of Adventures in Grace. Wonderful things are in store for the new year. Well, I'd like to actually go right into a testimony that we have from one of our regulars to just let you know how uh, individuals are appreciating not so much what I'm doing but what the Lord is doing through the things that we're saying, opening up to people's hearts the idea that God can become real in their lives changes everything. And so thank the Lord for these teachings, for sharing with you about the grace of God, the influence of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives every single day, getting to know God in a very real and tangible way. Well, let me read this story here. <clears throat> And this is from Judy. She shares a lot of different grace stories. And I encourage all of you to go to the website, which is jimhockaday.com, and you'll find our email, which is jhmi at jimhockaday.com, and let us know your grace stories. Now, I, I realize for most individuals, if we asked you, have you ever had an experience with God? Most people would say yes. The, the interesting part would be if you asked, when was it? So we're not looking, in a sense, to pull up stories uh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. What we're looking for are the stories that come from the things that we're sharing that are encouraging you to open up your heart and begin to see more clearly that God really is involved in your life. And if you will open up your heart even more and continue to invite him, which is where we're going in this What is Christianity series that won't take too much longer to get through, but we're going to acknowledgement. But before we get there, let me share this with you and it'll, it'll be perfect for what we're gonna share today. Better than ice cream. Well, that's because we had, you know, a couple of months, a few months ago, we had some ice cream stories. If you'll remember, it was a really fun story. Uh, the dear mother that had her, her kids in the car <clears throat> going through a fast food restaurant. They ordered so much, uh, she decided not to order the turtle ice cream sundae that she actually really wanted. Pulled up to the window to pay, and here's a gal coming toward her with a sundae in her hand and walks right to her, sticks it out the window and says, here's your turtle ice cream sundae. And she kind of looked a little bit like, well, I didn't order a sundae. She said, oh, well, it's our mistake. It's yours if you'd like it. And of course, that's just grace. It's just God listening to your heart. Does that mean every time you pull up to a fast food restaurant, you're gonna get free food? <clears throat> Obviously, that's not the point of the story as much as it is learning that even your thoughts when you're beginning to connect with God, becomes something that becomes very tangible in your life where you experience what God is doing, not only in your prayers, but also in your thoughts. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think, Ephesians 3 and verse 20. See, Paul was encouraging us that the tangibility of this relationship brings you into very, very uh, ex uh, wonderful and, and very constant uh, testimonies of God's grace. Well, here we go. <clears throat> no, just kidding, but this is just off the charts. I work for three gentlemen as their office manager for their roofing, construction, and masonry companies. It's a wonderful uh, work from home position, and the men are absolutely great. I pay their personal taxes on the 15th of each month. October, I had let grace get away from me, the cares of the world, and failed to pay. Paid the 16th, hadn't heard anything for a week or so, so I thought maybe all was well. Nope, I get an email, all taxes are due in 15 days. Yes, they have the money, but that wasn't the issue. So I called and spoke to a very nice person, sent in documents she requested and was getting ready to contact today to discuss that hopefully they would grant leniency since this was the first time. Got an email today, they were informing the whole state that there had been a computer glitch during the time frame of my mess up, sending an email letting everyone know to just 
uh, prove payment and all would be fine. And then she writes to me, Jim Hockaday, I don't know for sure, but if you hadn't been teaching, training those of us who want a relationship with him, you will never convince me that that would have happened. I just chose to receive grace in that situation. Yes, I had to take hold of some yucky thinking daily thoughts, you know, that would come from all of us out in this world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Teachers are getting stronger and so are we. And so what a wonderful story for us right at the Christmas time to just let you know, it's so important that you involve God in your life and involve him through his grace. Why do you talk so much about grace? We're gonna get into some things here in just a moment. It's because grace identifies with us in the fact that it wasn't by our works or our doing or our much effort that we have received from the Lord. For by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, when we say it's grace stories, it's all about what he's doing. Our part is to connect to what he's doing. Amen. When we, over, over in Romans in chapter 8 in the Message Bible, it talks about if you're trying to measure uh, what you do by your moral muscle. You'll never get around to actually experiencing anything. Why? Because the harder you work, the further away from the grace of God you are. It doesn't mean we do nothing. It means we connect with him. And then it goes on to say, but those who embrace what God is doing for them find out that God is real and he, his results are real. And so this is what we're talking about. The more you engage with the Lord, the more you invite him by acknowledging him in every area of your life, the more tangible he will become. But just like our story, you know, where she mentioned and was, was, was transparent in the month of October, there were so many things going on, the cares of the world, you know. And it gets in the way of you being continually mindful of the Lord. Well, uh, this is so, so good, a wonderful way to open up this particular session. Well, as you know, number one, we provide these videos so that you can believe God and then know some things about experiencing him in a more tangible way. Number two, so that you can get your prayers answered. And number three, so that we can have, just like we did, grace stories right there. We always open up with Matthew 11, 27 to 30 in the Message Bible, because this is a perfect depiction of the invitation that Jesus gives us, which is so very real to us, that we might have the exact same relationship with God that Jesus enjoyed himself. In fact, I'm going over a lot of these things right now because I'm writing my book called What's Next, Papa, that includes all of this. I think you're really, really gonna like it. And I'm working on having my part done before the end of this year. And then, of course, we'll get it edited and get it into book form. And you'll hear about that on our website, on our future Adventures in Grace videos. And uh, so, so thankful for the things that God is doing. Well, it says, Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. The Father has given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father and son operation coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the son the way the father does, nor the father the way the son does, but I'm not keeping it to myself. Thank you, Jesus. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. Now think about that right there. Come to Jesus, get away with Jesus, and you'll recover your life. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like when Jesus pulled himself away from the crowds that had such a demand upon him and went into a solitary place to get away with the Father. It's like, it's like the Father saying, come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest, Jesus. And that's what Jesus did with regularity. He would get away so that in the solitude of the moment, there was nothing pressing on him, nothing pulling on him. There were no distractions. His mind was not cluttered. He was able to be free and allow himself to feel and experience the glory and the presence and the voice and the tangibility of his father. He came out of those situations so full that people just sought to touch the hem of his garment as many as touched him or made perfectly well. Now think about that in relationship to the results that we are to see, not only today, tomorrow, and the rest of our lives. Well, he went on then to say, come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. 
Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting upon you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Wow, so good. Now, I know we're 10 minutes into this video. We only have a few minutes left. But let me come over here to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 11 to 13, as we open up the idea and subject of acknowledgement. But before we do, let's talk about the wide open spaces of grace. Well, <clears throat> wide open spaces, what would be the opposite? Confined, closed, small spaces. Hmm. Which would you rather have, countryside or be locked up in a small little room staring at yourself in solitary confinement? No, people go crazy in solitary confinement. They weren't meant to live like that. God gave us an expanse, not only of the universe, but even of this world. And with 8 billion people that are on the face of the earth, there's still so much of the earth that has not even been tamed, if you will, that can that can accommodate so many more people. This world that we're in is an expanse, and God wants you to experience not only the joy of the expanse of this world, but so much more the joy of the expanse of spiritual things that has no limitation. Dear, dear Corinthians, I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open, spacious life. Well, I love that Paul said that. Why? Because they must be living something other. He went on to say, we didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel comes from within you. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. I'm speaking as plainly as I can with great affection. Open up your lives, live openly and expansively. Now notice, we must choose the life of Christ. We must choose the life of the Spirit. And to do so, we must desire to get out of these small, confined areas that fence us in called religion and tradition, where we have a form of godliness, but we deny the power. It's so important that we walk in the places of God, in the spirit where we can experience God. And Paul is giving a heartfelt cry to these Corinthians. Come on, you're living in a small way. Now your lives aren't small, but you're living them small. You're confined, you're fenced in. Why? Because you're full of religion and tradition. Religion and tradition will not allow you to experience the openness of God's grace, the expanse of spiritual, spiritual experience. It'll confine you to yourself. And if you haven't figured out by now that you can only do what you can do and you can't do pretty much beyond what you can do, which means the situations you're in, try harder. Well, how's that working for you? I know that sounds a little smart alecky, but the idea is you've been trying and trying and trying and trying. Don't you think it's time to stop trying and to open up your heart to the ability of Christ? Amen. That's where that invitation, Matthew 11, 27 to 30 in the Message Bible comes in so handy. Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover. No, don't. He didn't say, now keep doing what you're doing and keep doing more of what you're doing. You've been doing it for 10 years. It hasn't worked, but just keep doing it and go crazy. Live in a small cell. Be in solitary confinement or come to me. Let's get away into the wide open spaces of life and I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Some would say, well, watching how he does it is looking into the word of God and you would be extremely accurate. But that's not all there is to it. <clears throat> Jesus didn't look into the law to see what his father was doing. He said, I only do what I see my father do. So there was a tangible everyday experience and constant communion and contact with his father where he was actually aware of what his father was doing and what his father wanted him to do. So it's not just seeing those things that are in the word, and yet it is. But it's also seeing the things in your relationship with your father. Let's go on a little bit. This is good. Romans chapter 6, verse 1, and the, and the message says, so what do, I, what do we do? 
keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? I should hope not. If we've left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? Or didn't you realize we packed up and left there for good? That is what happened in baptism. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. When we came up out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace. A new life in a new land. That's what baptism into the life of Jesus means. When we are lowered into the water, it is like the burial of Jesus. When we are raised up out of the water, it is like the resurrection of Jesus. Each of us is raised into a light-filled world by our Father so we can see where we're going in our new grace-sovereign country. What does this sound like? It sounds like the wide open spaces of life. It sounds like grace. Yes, this is what Paul is endeavoring to share with us. There is a place where you can live free, not only free from the things of life, but free in your soul to experience God, no longer cluttered with those things of the world. But you have to shift gears and change your perspective of the way you see things. You know, I love the story with Judy. She made mention of the fact that there was some yucky thinking that she had to actually cast down, you know, for those moments when she was trusting the Lord. It doesn't mean that just because you choose what is of heaven, that this earthly world and sin consciousness, the devil, and this twisted mentality of society won't try to beat your brains in. Yes, thoughts will come, but I love what Brother Hagin said years ago. Thoughts may come, but thoughts will go. Thoughts left unacted upon will, will, will be unborn. I think that's pretty close to what he was saying. In other words, you know, just because you have thoughts doesn't mean you've done wrong. No, thoughts will come and thoughts will go. Just don't act on them. And they what? They die unborn. They, they do not succeed. So we're learning some things about this wonderful life. I like what Paul says here. He's just giving us some really wonderful thoughts here about this grace sovereign country. This is where we're headed. This is where we are. This is what we desire to live in these wonderful places. Come on, just another couple of minutes and then we'll be done. Oh, I love this over in Romans chapter 8, 3 to 11 in the Message Bible. God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son, Jesus, he personally took on the human condition, entered the distorted mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. If Jesus entered the mess of struggling humanity to deliver it once and for all, then we don't have to live there. He already did it. The law code, weakened as it was by fractured human nature, that's the sin nature, could never have done that. The law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing of it. And now that the law code asked for, now what the law code asked for, but we couldn't deliver, is accomplished as we, listen, instead of redoubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing in us. Those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their moral muscle but never get around to exercising it in real life. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's spirit is in them, living and breathing God. You want to find God? Then stop the work and the effort of trying to produce something in yourself and just simply trust in the fact that he's doing what he's doing and you'll begin to experience him. It's the acknowledgement of Jesus and what he's doing that brings you into the experience of God's grace. I love this right here. It goes on to say obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open spaces of free life. Don't you like that? The open Uh, spacious, free life. This is where we are. How do we get that? Attention to God. And then he goes on to say, uh, say it this way, focusing on self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God, ends up thinking more about self than God. This person ignores who God is and what he is doing. But God isn't pleased at being ignored. 
But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. And of course, he goes on to talk about the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead will quicken and make alive in us everything, praise the Lord, that is necessary. Well, just really quickly, I don't have time, but we'll come back here and start. You know, when Paul talks to the Corinthians about step out into the wide open spaces of life, the next thing that he does is he begins to clarify and separate and bring distinction to the things of the world and the things of the spirit. Why? What fellowship has Christ with Belial? Has the unbeliever with the, uh, the believer? Light with darkness. You see, he begins to separate what is and what isn't. And this is where we're headed so that we can become more clear and more focused and step out into the wide open spaces of grace. God bless you all. Have a wonderful Christmas. You can go to Adventures in Grace and subscribe. Bring people to the broadcast. Let them see for themselves that they can experience testimonies like we've already shared with you. You can go to Jim Hockett and Ministry Facebook page and follow us. Uh, but for sure, J-H-M-I at jimhockaday.com. Share with us your testimonies. See you later.